בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We're back, ברוך השם, the first time this week to uh, do our שיעורים, ברוך השם, the Stump the Rabbi series, we are, uh, ברוך השם, and בסייעתא דשמיא, have uh, reached episode 200 in uh, this series, it's been going on for several years, ברוך השם, it's our longest standing series. And uh, this episode 200 is certainly going to be a special one because it's going to give us some uh, food for thought on a lot of different things. And one of the big things is uh, saying goodbye to the rabbi. Uh, and uh, after all of these years of uh, about a decade or so of giving lectures, uh, there's a lot of experience that have come with it. And there are certainly things that uh, need to be discussed because uh, we've seen a lot of things. We hear a lot of things. We... Uh, plan a lot of things, and uh, certainly uh, this is the time to discuss all of it, Be'ez uh, Hashem. Tonight's uh, shiur is uh, going to be for the Refua uh, Shlema, uh, for uh, Talia Bat uh, Sarah, who Be'ez uh, Hashem and Baruch Hashem uh, miraculously has uh, been saved from Amash, uh, uh, the Malach HaMavet, and is, uh, Uh, Baruch Hashem, thank you to all of your prayers, is out of the hospital now, the two-year-old daughter of Rabbi Ephraim and Rabbanit, Shulami, uh, um, Rabbanit Sarah. Uh, so Baruch Hashem, she's out of the hospital, and uh, Be'ezot Hashem will stay uh, healthy and continue uh, seeing miracles that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has uh, given us, Baruch Hashem. So today, the show today will be for her Refua Shlema, and also for the Refua Shlema for uh, Rabbanit uh, Sarah Bat Anat, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit. רבנית לבנה, בת שרה, שרה בת לבנה, אבי מורי דוד בן נסריה, אמי מורתי דוריס בת ז'ורה, uh, and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahides that uh, continue to support our organization and our teachings, uh, either by uh, donating money or uh, learning with us or both, ברוך השם. For anyone that wants to uh, fulfill the mitzvah, Uh, of uh, the Kimcha uh, de Pischa, as we do uh, each year. This is our biggest uh, campaign of the year, uh, the Kimcha de Pischa, which is helping the uh, poor Jews in Eretz Yisrael. We have our uh, campaign uh, live now. It's at uh, bhpesach.org, bhpesach.org, uh, bhp, uh, as in Pesach, e-s-a-c-h.org. Uh, you can donate over there. Baruch Hashem, we made a huge commitment Uh, today and over the last few days, there's been uh, many more families than we anticipated. Literally thousands and thousands of people are going to be fed during this uh, next uh, week and a half or so for Pesach. Uh, we're also having a uh, bunch of Torah scholars learn the uh, Talmud Bavli in a single day as part of their uh, contribution for Am Yisrael. We're going to obviously pay each one of them to help them for the holiday. There's 500 Avrechim, uh, representing 500 families uh, that are doing that. We're also going to have uh, a bunch of uh, kids in uh, Yerushalayim as well as in Tveria uh, that are going to be uh, studying Torah uh, on, uh, on your behalf, Be'ezrat Hashem, uh, throughout the Chol HaMoed uh, break and uh, beyond, actually. It's going to be a few weeks. Uh, so Be'ezrat Hashem, we're going to be doing that as well as there's many widows and orphans Uh, that Baruch Hashem uh, have come to, uh, to us uh, over the years, and uh, again this year, and as many others that we're meeting for the first time now, that need financial assistance. With all of the war that's happening and uh, the financial situation that's happening in Eretz Yisrael, there's a lot more help that's needed uh, than ever before. Uh, so anyone that wants to uh, contribute and help these poor people, uh, as well as get the mitzvah, Uh, of, uh, of, of the Torah that they learn, uh, could uh, donate on bhpesach.org. Uh, we have already committed to the financial amount, whether people donate or not. Uh, we know that uh, Hashem is going to help us, and uh, we're hoping that uh, you will uh, join us and be partners with us. So that's the, uh, that's the campaign. Uh, last but not least, anyone that wants to order books, Uh, to or USBs for free uh, to distribute in your community, go to bhkiruv.org. Uh, there's a lot of other things to say, uh, especially after an amazing trip uh, that we had uh, to New York last week. Uh, I know it was a surprise to some of you, 
uh, that, uh, you know, we did a last minute shiur in uh, New York. We had a family event, Bo Hashem, uh, both family and uh, Talmidim. Uh, Bo Hashem got married uh, last week, Chupa and Kiddushim. Uh, and it was a beautiful wedding, a uh, kosher wedding, holy wedding, a wedding that had uh, a couple of shiure Torah, Bo Hashem. Uh, we gave shiure Torah throughout the entire Shabbat. So there was a lot of Torah, Bo Hashem, over the uh, last uh, week or so. Unfortunately, we weren't able to record uh, much of it because it was Shabbat, but there are some that already went online and some that Bezalel Hashem will go online at some point in the future once we get the recordings. So with all of that being said, there is a lot to talk about, Rabotai Karim. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, I know that uh, people uh, are asking a lot of different questions in regards to the, uh, the whole situation uh, that happened with the solar eclipse, uh, the earthquake that happened in New York while I was there, uh, which between you and I uh, really didn't feel more like uh, an earthquake. I've been in earthquakes before in California uh, when I was there years ago, uh, but uh, the earthquake in, uh, in New York felt more like there was construction in the uh, room below me. It wasn't such a big deal like the media makes it seem to be, uh, but uh, needless to say, the sages do discuss earthquakes and solar eclipses, which we've discussed many times in the past. These are all different signs from a Kadosh Baruch Hu that it's, uh, it's time for us to do tshuva. But then again, everything is a sign for us to do tshuva. Why this versus others? In so many words, some things that Hashem does get the attention of certain people. Other things get the attention of other people. Some people need a uh, personal crisis. Some people need a health crisis. Some people need a war, an October 7th massacre. Some people need an earthquake, a solar eclipse, whatever works. Before Hashem makes the last stop and before Mashiach comes, he's going to try every single tool before he brings out the big guns. The big guns, which is the 15 days of darkness, the work of the war of Gog and Magog, all the things that we've discussed many times in the past. Uh, as and I've told you and I've learned from my very dear Rav, uh, it's never a good thing to uh, <clears throat> harp too much into the issues uh, of Mashiach where pretty much people are obsessed with the topic where the only thing they know about Torah is about what's going to happen when Mashiach is going to come, or what's supposed to happen before he comes. But if you ask him about the halachot of kashrut, if you ask him the, uh, uh, how to deal with uh, people, communication skills, how to deal with marriage, with children, they have no concept, they don't know right, they don't know left, they have no idea what to do. So harping too much on the Mashiach is uh, really uh, not good for your spiritual health. Uh, and in fact, this is one of the things that uh, w- brings us to where we are right now and, and, and part of the topic uh, of uh, saying goodbye. Saying goodbye, I understand that no one likes to say goodbye, uh, and, uh, but this is something that sometimes is absolutely necessary. Uh, while others, uh, it's a mistake of your life. So which one is it? Parashat Azriya tells us Everything we need to know. Everything we need to know, as it says, Vaidaber Adonai Moshe Lemor, Daber El Bne Israel Lemor, Isha Kitazria, Vialda Zahar, Vetama, Shivat Yamim, Kimeni Dat, Devotat Titma. Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, When a woman conceives and gives birth to a male, she shall be contaminated for a seven-day period as during the days of her separation, infirmity, shall she be contaminated. This is nida. Nida doesn't mean dirty. Nida does not mean evil. Nida comes from the word nuda. Nuda means move, something that moves. And the sages explain in the name of the chiskuni that uh, a woman... When she becomes Nida, when she has her menstrual cycle or when she gives birth, of course, the water breaks, there's blood and so on, she becomes Nida. She now moves from a certain state of reality where she was permitted to her husband into another form of reality where she is forbidden to her husband. She could certainly hug and kiss her children. She can certainly hug and kiss her sisters and her parents, but her husband she's forbidden from hugging him kissing him holding his hand and in fact the shulchan aruch 
in Yore Dea, in Siman 195, talks about all of the different laws in regards to the obligation of a wife and a husband to separate and distance themselves from each other, where it's forbidden for them to eat from the same plate or the same bowl, uh, drink from the same cup is forbidden, they're certainly forbidden from sleeping in the same bed. All of these things are forbidden when a woman is nida. She has moved to a different reality, in, if you will, where during that time she is, uh, uh, you know, she is not allowed to her husband. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 12, has a story, famous story, where a woman that was married to a young Torah scholar, a chassid, uh, is, walks you know, into the Bet Midrash crying hysterical because her husband, the chassid, died. And she says to the sages, how could it be? My husband learned Torah. He did mitzvot. How could it be that Hashem has killed him? And the Chachamim in that particular Bet Midrash were not able to answer her. They're not prophets. They don't necessarily have the permission to all of Hashem's ideas. Uh, but uh, needless to say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu heard her cry and he sent Eliyahu Navi. Eliyahu Navi walks into the Bet Midrash and he sees the woman screaming and looking for answers and he says to her, my dear daughter, your husband, the Chassid, did he touch you while you were Nida? She says, no, Chas v'shalom, apitom, he never touched me, we were never intimate when I was Nida. He did not eat non-kosher food. He did not waste seed. No, no, no. Eliyahu Navi says to her, but did he sleep in the same bed with you? And she says, yes, he slept in the same bed with me while I was Nida, but we never touched. Eliyahu Navi says to her, blessed is the righteous God for killing your husband. And of course, the Chachamim say, how can you say this to a widow? What's the... What's the pshat here? What's the pshat? What's the simple understanding here? You're telling a widow that God is blessed for killing her husband. Eliyahu Navi explains, your husband violated the decree of the sages to separate not just the decree of the Torah, which is not to touch you, but also the decree to stay away from sin. And blessed is the righteous God that removed him from this world before he made a sin. Because obviously, if he disregarded this, the teachings of the sages, it was only a matter of time before he was going to disregard the words of Hashem. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Nida, page 31b, teaches us something else about this separation. This goodbye that the husband has to say to the wife and the wife has to say to the husband every single month in a Jewish marriage. Non-Jews are not obligated in the uh, matters of Nida. They are allowed, a husband and a wife are allowed to be with each other whenever they want, even during the menstrual cycle, even though it's disgusting. Needless to say, it is not forbidden for Goim. But for Jews, on the other hand, if a man... If a Jew is with a woman that's nida, whether it's his girlfriend or it's his wife, it's an isur karet. It's literally in the worst category of sins uh, that destroy his mazal, destroy his parnasah, destroy his connection to Hashem. May Hashem save us from such sins uh, in this generation. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Nida, page 31b, brings us Rabbi Meir Balanes. Rabbi Meir Balanes, there's not a soul on planet Earth that knows Torah and does not know who Rabbi Meir Balanes is. Rabbi Meir is called Rabbi Meir, the master of miracles. That's how many miracles he made in the, in, from the hands of a Baruch Hu. Rabbi Meir Balanes brings a new teachings. And he asks... Why does the Torah here, in our parasha, parashat Tazria, decree this separation, this distance 
of seven days between a husband and a wife during our menstrual cycle and even longer after she gives birth because obviously she bleeds for a much longer time why what is this for what is why would Hashem want the husband to say goodbye to the wife and the wife to say goodbye to the husband especially since sometimes you just want a hug sometimes you want to you know be intimate without intimacy so why would Hashem want this Rabbi Meir Balanes tells us and uncovers one of the most profound secrets to a healthy Jewish marriage and the reason why the Jewish people that follow the Torah have virtually no divorce rate in comparison to the Gentiles throughout history certainly divorces do happen but if you compare the single percentage points of of divorces in the Jewish world and I'm talking about orthodox observant Torah houses versus the secular Jewish world or the non-Jewish world literally there's no comparison it might as well be zero so Rabbi Meir tells us and uncovers this secret what is this secret Rabbi Meir Baranes says the reason why Kadosh Baruch Hu made the woman's body do this is in order to separate them meaning there is actually an intentional separation here that Hashem desires between a husband and a wife because if she is always going to be permitted to him if he can touch her whenever he wants she will eventually become disgusting in his eyes she will eventually become someone that upsets him she will eventually become less desirable in his eyes and because Hashem wants the marriage between a Jew and his wife to be as great as it was during that night of Chupa and Kiddushin he made the woman's body have this forced separation forced goodbye for the sake of saving the marriage and actually making it even better meaning that this distance is for the sake of greater closeness after the separation is done because now you miss each other now you realize that you should take advantage of the opportunity that you're permitted to each other and not waste your time and energy and lives fighting arguing and doing all types of things that are destructive this is also the reason why when you look at Torah scholars regardless of whether they're in their 20s 30s 50s or 80s with their wives you can see the love that they have for each other in their eyes without them ever touching each other because certainly they would never touch each other in front of you because it's forbidden according to the Torah for a man to show affection to a woman in public even if it's his wife but as far as the love that they have for each other the care they have for each other the respect and honor they have for each other literally you can see it in their eyes and it's a beautiful thing Rabbi Meir Baroness says part of the reason this is the case is because of the prohibition of Nida the separation the distance the goodbye is for the sake of further closeness and a bigger love between the two up to here we have discussed some things that you knew some things perhaps are new for ones that want to know further about the Jewish marriage and intimacy we have an entire series about it based on the writings of the Ramban from about 750 years ago called Jewish intimacy the most profound uh, teachings about the topic ever done in the English language uh, and this is not because it's me speaking it but rather because of the teachings that of the Ramban that have never been done in English before uh, certainly not in video format so you could watch it with your wife with your husband 
and you could literally transform your lives as a result. But this is not the only goodbye we wanted to talk about, of course. One of the great Chachamim that lived about 160 years ago, not as famous as others, but needless to say, this story is going to make him permanently famous in your eyes, in your mind. And certainly, if the story is not engraved in your soul, you should check if you're still alive. His name was Rabbi Yeshaya Bardaki. Rabbi Yeshaya Bardaka, Bardaki learned from the Talmidim of the Gaon Mivilna in Yeshiva Dvolojin, and he eventually decided to make Aliyah with his young son and daughter. Make Aliyah to Eretz Yisrael. And this Chacham tells the story, a story that certainly is going to shock you from beginning to end. Rabbi, Rabbi Yeshai Bardaki went on the boat with his young son and his young daughter. And of course, the boats of 160 years ago, 200 years ago, were not like what we have today. And certainly, it wasn't a good day to be on a boat. There was an extraordinary sea, um, waves, thunder, lightning, huge rocking in the boat to the point where the boat was wrecked and the boat crashed and start, drowned in the ocean. Rabbi Yishai Bardaki grabbed his two little kids miraculously grabbed one of the wooden panels that broke off of the boat and tried as hard as he could to swim to the coast. But to his disappointment, he realized that he does not have the power, he does not have the wherewithal to do this while holding both of his kids. He realized that if he continues, they're all going to drown. And he has to let go of one of them. Now, of course, this is no easy to say, and needless to say, was even more difficult to do. But when a person operates according to the Torah, they have all of the rules for every single circumstance already in their mind. And Rav Bardaki knew that the Shulchan Aruch paskins, that in circumstances of extreme situations like this, the male is what you choose to save over the female. Not because a male is better, but rather because the boy is obligated to do more mitzvot, according to the Torah, fulfill the will of Hashem in more ways than the woman, and therefore, for the sake of the tikkun olam, for the rectification for the, of the world and serving Hashem in the highest level, Torah says, if you have to choose, then you have to save your son first. And as difficult as it was, Rav Bardaki knew that if he doesn't let his daughter's hand go, they're all going to die. And therefore, he let her go. As he let her go and tried his best to move forward further and further along while his daughter was left behind trying to save herself, screaming, crying, and getting further and further from her father and her brother. As heart-wrenching as it is, it got even worse. Where at one moment, the daughter of Rav Bardaki screams, Abba! And Rav Bardaki turns around and sees his daughter crying. He says, Abba! There's no one else to save me! Only you can save me! And at that moment, 
Rav Bardaki says he suddenly got powers that were beyond human, powers that he never knew existed, needless to say, in himself. When he saw his daughter cry, when he saw his daughter scream, and when he heard his daughter say that there's no one else to save her, he got the wherewithal to go and swim back to his daughter, grab her, bring her back to where his son was, and then carry the three of them all the way to the shore, swimming one wave after another until all three of them got to the shore where he collapsed completely. Rabardaki says the powers that he had at that moment were not human. They were not something that you can train for. They were not something that you could even think about. And in fact, he knew this for the rest of his life. And he would always teach his daughter, the very same daughter that he saved. And he said to her, and he reminded her over the years, my dear daughter, if you scream to Hashem and you tell him, Abba, I don't have anyone else to save me. Only you can help me. Only you can save me. Then Abba will help you. Hashem will come and help you. He will save you. When a person admits that there's an od milvado, that there's nothing else but God, that in itself can bring a person to salvation. But there's a further Musar lesson here to learn, as I learned from my dear Rav, Rav Ephraim. He says, the love and the strength that Rav Bardaki had for his daughter was obviously extraordinary. But it wasn't enough to save her. Until he let her go. Until he let her hand go, he separated from her. He acknowledged the fact that this was a necessary distance. But when she said, Abba, there's no one else to save me. Rav Bardaki had his love and strength for his daughter grow exponentially higher than what it ever was before and what it ever could have been had he not separated from her. And from there, Rabotai Karim, we learn that the decline, the distance, was for the sake of closeness, was for the sake of a rise, that would ultimately happen. If he didn't leave her, he would have never gathered those strength and love that he had when she screamed out his name. Therefore, our sages teach in the Gemara in Masichet Brachot, in the place that Baalei Tshuva stand, even the righteous cannot get to. Why? Because once a person abandons Hashem, goes and desecrates Shabbat, goes and commits all types of immorality, all types of thievery, all types of lies, desecrates the name of God in every way, shape, and form, but then ultimately looks back and says, Abba, I need you. No one else can save me. And makes their return back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the love that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has for this Baal Tshuva is even greater than someone that has never distanced himself from Hashem in the first place. This Rabotai, 
is what the sages are trying to teach us because all of the sins all of these sins that the Baal Tshuva has made that's distancing them from God but the Baal Tshuva returning to Hashem increases the love that Hashem has to even higher levels than it was had they not sinned certainly it's not recommended for one to sin just in case just for the sake of having higher love as the Mishnah says someone that says that they will sin in order to do tshuva never gets punished with never having the merit of doing tshuva no one is allowed to game the system but the point being is the sages teaches that if a person has already distanced himself they can use that distance for the sake of rising even higher than they would have had otherwise been able to. This is just like the separation of the woman with her husband when she's nida. The separation, the decline is for the sake of an incline. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't always work out so well. And the reason why is because sometimes there are people that do tshuva, that get chizuk, that transform their life. Due to the teachings of the rabbi that guides them, that nurtures them, that teaches them. And time passes a year, five years, ten years, however long it is, and that student, that Talmud, that Baal Tshuva, forgets where they came from, and in fact, starts to believe their own delusions, that perhaps, I've had enough of this rabbi, perhaps it's time for me to graduate to a better rabbi, a greater rabbi, because I already know everything this rabbi has to teach. He's already taught me for the last five years. What else could he possibly teach? Let me go delve into a different rabbi, someone that's more famous, someone that's older, someone that has written more books. Let me go somewhere else, somewhere where I can rise even higher. Unfortunately, that Talmud's decision to leave his rabbi is a decline. It is a terrible decision. And as Rabbi Nachman Mibreslev teaches, when a person leaves their source, their rabbi, it's like leaving the tzaddik, who was your vessel to the spiritual nourishment of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you're thinking you're going to get better nourishment somewhere else, but you're sadly mistaken because that's not your address. That's not your source. And in fact, Rabotai Karim, when a person makes such a decision, it is coming only from pride. It's coming only from arrogance. It's not coming from a good place. It's not coming because the person really wants to rise to higher places. It comes from a place where the person already thinks they are in a higher place than even the rabbi that taught them and brought them to where they are. Now, as long as that person does not realize that their goodbye to their rabbi is a decline they will never be able to turn things around and use that decline for the sake of an incline, for the sake of rising even higher. So long as that person is adamant about their goodbye, their abandonment of the source that got them to where they were, what they don't realize is that they are on a steady decline And to explain it better, the Jewish world always offers a story. 
at the time of the Baal Shem Tov, there were many simple Jews. But in those days, when you hear the Chachamim say a simple Jew, they're not talking about a simple Jew like someone who doesn't keep Shabbat, someone who uh, doesn't keep family purity. Simple Jew means that he keeps Torah and mitzvot, he keeps Shabbat, he keeps family purity. He's just not a Torah scholar of uh, you know of uh, upper echelon. Certainly he knows the weekly parasha, he knows some basics, but he's not a Torah scholar. This also explains the story of the Rebbe Rashash that told his Hasidim that there was a simple Jew that had a very special neshama. Some foolish people understood it to mean that the simple Jew meant like a secular Jew. This is nothing further from the truth in such a thing. Simple Jew simply means a Jew that keeps Torah and mitzvot but is not a Torah scholar. We'll talk about that particular thing at another time. But to stay on topic, the times were difficult. Poverty was standard for many Jews. But there were certainly some Jews that were in better situation than others. And there was a Jew that came into the Bet Midrash and saw that there is a young Torah scholar learning Torah dedicated and he was really enamored by this young scholar's dedication to the Torah and he sat next to him listening to him and then he said to him what do you need? he says no nothing I'm just learning Torah he said yeah but how do you make a living? He says, oh, you know, sometimes people donate to help me out a little bit. Uh, that's all. That's how I, I learned Torah. He says, fine. From now on, I'm going to give you 10,000 rubles every month so you can learn Torah in peace and not have to worry about your 10 children having food or not having food. Fantastic. This is like the Issachar and Zvulun, agreement, where one works and the other one studies and both share the merits. So this went on for some time and from the moment this businessman Jew started giving this young scholar money, he started hitting one success after another and he went from being successful to becoming a multi-millionaire. This was the best deal of his life. One day he wants to come and see his scholar learning, give him the money that he gives him each month. And he sees the young scholar packing his stuff and about to get ready for a trip. He says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to see my rabbi. Oh, can I come? Sure. The, of course you can see the Chosemi Lublin is my rabbi. He's a gadol b'torah, he's a tzaddik. Just seeing him is already a, uh, a, a merit. Sure, I would like to see him. And he goes, they go on a journey together. They get to see the Chosemi Lublin and the businessman Jew sees that all types of Torah scholars, young and old, famous and not, are coming to the Chosemi Lublin asking him for guidance, asking him for help, asking him all types of questions. And as the Gemara says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created man straight, honest, and we ruined it when we started doing calculations, we started doing cheshbonot. And the businessman started doing cheshbonot, started doing calculations, and he said, If I became a millionaire by giving this young scholar 10,000 rubles a month, if I give the 10,000 rubles to his rabbi, to the Chosemi Lublin, I'll become a billionaire. And on that day, he decided to start giving the money to the Chosemi Lublin. But as you would have it, each time he gave He had a lot of confidence that this is going to make him even richer. But to his dismay, he started losing money. 
He lost more and more until he had to start selling some of his property and then more of his property, then his precious metals, then the cattle that he had and all types of things of valuable possessions had to be sold so he can stay afloat to the point where he was no longer able to give the 10,000 rubles. And at that point, after losing so much, he remembered that young scholar that used to answer his questions, that young scholar that he invested so much into, that brought him success. And he said he must know the answer. And he went to go and he saw him in the same Bet Midrash, sitting in the same chair, learning the same Torah with utmost dedication. And he sat next to him and he says, I don't understand. When I gave you the 10,000 rubles, I became very successful. But then when I gave it to the Chosemi Lublin, who certainly even you yourself say is a much greater rabbi than you are, I lost everything almost. How could that be? Why would Hashem do this to me? The young scholar says, I, you do not understand how the matters of heaven work. You understand business. And you judge the matters of the upper world like you judge business. But Hashem doesn't run the world that way. You see, when you came into the Bet Midrash, you didn't know who I was. You didn't know what I was. You didn't judge. You simply saw someone that was studying Torah with dedication and you decided you're going to invest in it. Without asking any questions, without doing any calculations, is he famous? Is he this? Is he that? Is he the best investment? You invested into Torah. So when your tzedaka arrived at the bed dean of heaven, and they wanted to start analyzing, who is giving this tzedaka for the sake of this rabbi, for the sake of this Torah? Hashem came and said, no, You cannot evaluate. Why? He didn't evaluate. And we must treat him the same way he he treated the Torah. He didn't evaluate, therefore he is not evaluating. Because he gave, I must reward him. With no other consideration. And therefore the reward that you got did not evaluate anything else. But then when you saw my rabbi, you saw, oh, Big rabbi, famous rabbi, I'm going to invest in the best rabbi. You started evaluating which one is better or which one is worse. So when that tzedakah came up to Shemaim, the same Bedin said, who is giving this tzedakah for the sake of Torah? And Hashem says, let's look at everything that he has done. Why? Because this tzedakah was given under evaluation, not just any evaluation, but a determination of what is the best, only going to give to the best, to the highest, to the most famous, not necessarily just for the sake of Torah. And when they evaluated you and your actions and how you observed the Torah and mitzvot, suddenly you were no longer the best. Why? Hashem says there are plenty of better choices in the world for me to give them more money. There are people that are more generous than Him. There are people that are more righteous than Him. There are people that are more observant than Him. Why should I give to Him? I'm going to give to the best. Because He evaluated and determined to give to the best, I have to do the same thing and treat Him in kind. And therefore, that blessing that you had of blind faith into the Torah for the sake of the Torah was lost. And you started losing all of the blessing. Rav Ephraim explains that the same thing applies with people that come and learn Torah. And what they don't learn, what they don't realize, is that when a person abandons his rabbi, especially one that gave him most of his knowledge, most of his chizuk that influenced his life, 
even made him or her do tshuva. And he abandons him because he says, I'm going to go to a more famous rabbi. I'm going to go to a bigger Torah scholar. Heaven also judges that student the same way. You received an endless amount of Torah from that vessel because you didn't say, I want a best, I want this. You simply wanted to learn my Torah. And therefore I gave the rabbi specific words for you to learn from. Things that applied to you specifically were put into his mouth. And not only that, I gave you the ability to retain them, to remember them. Much of people's Torah is forgotten. They learn Torah, but they forget literally by the end of the lecture, they already forgot what the rabbi said. They complete a book, but if you ask them what happened in the middle of the book, what happened in the beginning of the book, or what happened even 10 pages ago, 9 out of 10 times they don't remember. Why? Torah is gifted to you. It's gifted to you. But when a person says, no, I'm only going to learn from someone that's the most famous, from someone that's the most popular, from someone that has this and someone that has that, you became picky and you abandoned the source that I gave you. Now Hashem says, I have to be picky with who I give the Torah for. I have to also be picky and determine whether you are still the best vessel to have these ideas, to retain that Torah, to have that special divine assistance where the rabbi is going to speak things that are relevant to your life, where the rabbi is going to actually care enough about you to be willing to answer your questions at any time during the day. Now I have to determine that too. And a person does not realize how much they have just lost because of their choices. As David Melech says in Psalm 119, verse number 99, Mikol melamdai skalti. From all of my teachers, I grew wise. I can grow wise from my rabbi. I can grow wise from my chavruta. I can grow wise from my students. I can learn Torah in endless ways. Why? Because the Torah is gifted. It's gifted to me. So long as I'm willing to sacrifice for it, so long as I'm willing to toil, so long as I'm willing to do it without putting my arrogance in the way, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give me endless Torah in every different possible way. But once I allow my arrogance to take the wheel, then you lose the blessing. You lose the blessing. David the Melech got to the point where he lived this. He lived with an understanding that he could learn and have the divine assistance to learn extraordinary insights from every single source to the point where just a couple of verses later in verse number 104 in the same Tehillim, David Melech says, I hate every path of lies, meaning that he got to the point where he loved the truth and knew so much of the truth that everything else was a lie and he hated it. Now, lastly, when a person thinks about saying goodbye to the rabbi and decides to move in a different direction because they heard the rabbi say something that they didn't like, whether it's something that's pertaining to them or their family member or somebody they know or whatever it is, or they got rebuked by the rabbi or they just don't want to listen to the rabbi anymore for whatever the reason is. This goodbye to the rabbi is so foolish that only gava, only arrogance, could be the one thing that motivates it. Meaning, abandoning your rabbi cannot be motivated by holiness, by humility, by desire to learn more. It's not possible. Why? Because if a person actually knew enough 
Torah to understand the ramification of their decision, they would never make such a decision. Because the amount of loss that they get from abandoning their source, literally, only a person that is purely motivated by arrogance would make such a decision. Because that decline is the same decline like a nida. But a nida, a woman that's nida, but does not want to become purified at the end of the seven days. She doesn't want to go to the mikveh anymore. And what she doesn't realize is that if she does not want to stop being nida, if she does not want to go dip in the mikveh and follow what the Torah says, then she will be thrown out. She will get a get, but without getting any of the reward that comes with it because she's violating the foundational laws. Now, if a Talmit Chacham is something that you have been privy to have access to, someone that knows Torah and teaches Torah and you are actually someone that's learning from that person, you're only going to realize the great benefit of what you have as more time passes. Unfortunately, most people don't realize what they have until it's lost. Now, as we saw from the story of the extraordinary Chacham, Rav Yeshaya Bardaki, that his love for his daughter and the newfound strength that allowed him to save himself and his daughter and son was only after she screamed, Abba, I don't have anybody else to save me. If a student, if a Talmud realizes that Abba, no one else can save me. No one else can be my vessel. No one else is going to care about me like you. No one else is going to teach me and I will understand and remember and apply like you. Why? Because this is the will of Hashem. He chose for this to be the source. It's not that this is the only source that exists, but for that person, that's the source. There are many pipes on the ground. Each pipe delivers something. Whether it's water, electricity, sewage, whatever it is. Now, there are many different pipes. Each one does what it does. You can't say, no, I want to use that pipe because I like that one better. Well, that one is using itself for sewage. You want clear water. You can't use that. Yeah, but I want that one. But you, if you take that one, you can have it if you want, but you're not going to get water. You're going to get sewage. You're going to get people that are going to tell you things that are against the Torah. But if you want... Be my guest. Go ahead and try it out. Maybe you're deluding yourself enough to the point to think that you could change the system. Maybe you're even deluding yourself enough to the point where you think you don't even need the system. Now when a Talmud realizes that Abba, no one else can save me. Sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes is not enough. But if they do make the right decision and they realize that it's not enough to just know this, I have to go back. I have to swallow my pride and go back and say I'm sorry and go do whatever I can to turn this decline into a rise, into an incline. What ends up happening, Rabbi Tayyip Karim, is the same as the story, the same as all of the examples, the same as what the Gemara is saying. Once a person does that, the newfound connection is much greater than it was before, and in fact, much greater than it would have been had the disconnect never happened. It's just like a nida that was arrogant and did not want to go to the mikveh but then when she finally realizes that this is only 
a dead end street and she realized, you know what, I'm going to go to the mikveh. And when she's eventually in the arms of her husband, she realizes that it was all worth it. It's even better now. I love him more now. He loves me more now. And she realizes that that distance ended up serving as a stepping stool for a rise. But if a person does not make the right decision, in fact, they realize they made the wrong decisions or they completely ignore the fact that there's even a bad decision to be made because their gava, their pride, their arrogance is what is driving, is what is steering, is what is deciding. Then Rabotai Karim, that gava will lead to destruction much worse than they can possibly imagine. Because just like the nida that does not want to be purified eventually gets thrown out, if not a week, a month, a year later, at some point or another, the destruction is unfixable. The same thing with someone that has pride and goes and it says goodbye to their source of spiritual nourishment from Hashem. That person that does not come back because of their pride, they end up destroying themselves. How? Because even when they realize that they've made a mistake, their pride will not allow them to fix it. Because they say, wait, but if I come back now, what is he going to say about me? But if I come back now, what is he going to think about me? But if I come back now... It's like I'm a loser. But if I come back now, it's like I'm wrong. But if I come back now, and they do all of this calculation and literally put more walls in front of themselves. More walls in front of themselves. Until they get to the point where they decide for themselves that it's unfixable. I can't go back. It's too far. And the sages teach that when a person makes these types of decisions, when a person makes these types of decisions to the point where they disagree with their rabbi, they should know that in Shemaim, they are considered as if they disagree with Hashem also. Why? Because that rabbi was the vessel that Hashem was using to give you spiritual nourishment to give you an idea of what he wants from you, to give you directions of how to get to your own purpose in life. And when you disagree with the rabbi, you are disagreeing with God. Not because the rabbi is God, but rather because God is literally using that rabbi to talk to you, to give you instructions. And when a person disagrees with a Kadosh Baruch Hu, when a Kadosh Baruch Hu disagrees with you, it's one thing. But when you disagree with a Kadosh Baruch Hu, it's something completely different. And that's where the Yetzirah catches, unfortunately, too many Baalei Tshuva that have overcome their desires of immorality, of chasing money, of all types of things. So they're not going to violate Shabbat. They're not going to skip prayers. They're not going to do all of the open crimes they did in the past. But the Yetzirah says, don't worry, kid. I got you anyway. How? He's going to catch you with pride. He's going to make you think you're more righteous than the rabbi. He's going to make you think you don't have to listen to the rabbi. He's going to make you think you don't even need a rabbi. Why? He learns books. I learn books. He goes to shul. I goes to shul. He reads, I read. Why? What's the difference between us? The same exact argument was made by Yeshua Nutsri, Machshimo Vezichro. And that's why we say Machshimo Vezichro. Because he made the same type of rationale that ended up to the destruction of not only himself, but literally countless Jews over the last 2,000 years. Rabbi Cheske Levenstein, I love a shalom was once in a meeting of rabbis where one of the elder rabbis 
there was a guest there said, listen, you should all listen to me because well, I don't have anything to gain out of it. Um, I don't have any desire for honor. Rabbi Cheskel Levestein, which was fire and truth, stood up. He said, I'm sorry, Kvodo. But according to our sages, while all of the desires wane over time, the desire for immorality, the desire for this, the desire for that, they all go down over time as a person ages. The desire for honor never wanes. So everybody has the desire. There's no such thing as nobody has the desire. And that very same Rabbi Cheske Levinstein, when he walked into his Bet Midrash one time and he saw that the Talmidim, hundreds of Talmidim were protesting because there was a lack of food. They wanted to get the attention of the rabbis. So how did they protest? They took their shirts, undergarments, tank tops, whatever it was, and they hung them all over the Bet Midrash to cause, you know, a pandemonium, to cause chaos. As soon as Rav Yecheske Levenstein walked in and saw this, there were Talmidim around him and he said, make sure you tell whoever did this that if they don't remove all of it in the next few minutes, they will not finish the year. He walked out of the room and literally within an instant, everybody that was there ran all over the place just to get the stuff out of there because they knew when Rabbi Cheske Levenstein says something, he doesn't say for no reason. It's like a Kadosh Baruch who speaks through his throat. They took everything off. They understood that everyone knows the message, but this was too far. Rabbi Cheske Levenstein said, this is disrespect of the Chachamim, this is disrespect of the Torah. This is disrespect of Hashem. Too far. We understand. You want food, you want that, no problem. This is not the way to do it. This is not the way to do it. This Rabbutai Karim is one of the most valuable lessons that a person must know because I've seen this, unfortunately, because I deal with literally thousands and thousands of people I see a lot of wonderful stories of how people transform their lives from literally being on a one-way ticket to Gehenom to being in a life of heaven. Life of heaven, needless to say, afterlife. But at some point or another, Yetzirah catches them. And they abandon ship because they think they know already what the rabbi is going to say in his next statement. They think they already are on equal level, you know, ground as the rabbi. They think that they could learn and move in different directions, whatever suits their boat during that time of their life, not realizing the ramification of their decisions. And unfortunately, I've seen the disaster these things lead to. You can't stop anybody, and quite frankly, I don't even try to, because there's just too many people that you have to help. Too many people are drowning. You can't spend all of your energy on the people that are running, even though they're running in the wrong direction. They have to come to terms themselves. They have to realize they've made the wrong decision. You can't convince them otherwise, even if you try. And because there are so many people, you get to experience a lot of wonderful things. Last week, I saw two of my students, one being a family member. Baruch Hashem transformed their lives from literally complete violation of the Torah and mitzvot to being two young people that had a holy wedding. A holy wedding, separate wedding, beautiful wedding with shure Torah, with mitzvot, with, with literally people that came to that wedding started to do tshuva. The whole weekend was full of shure Torah. But if you would have looked at these same two a few years ago, you wouldn't recognize them. You wouldn't recognize them. And Be'ezrat Hashem, they continue on that path. And we've had the privilege of being part of many stories like this. But unfortunately, not all of them have a happy end. As I've told you in the past, there was one time a person that started to donate, was giving 20% of their income, wanted to show that they have faith in Emunah and Hashem. And literally, in a very short period of time of less than, I think, a year and a half or so, 
Hashem blessed this person where their income went from a couple hundred thousand dollars to over four or five million dollars. An enormous amount of money in a very short period of time. But once they got to that point, they decided that giving 20% to the source was no longer something they had to do. Perhaps let's spread it out and put it in a bunch of other places. Before you know it, they stopped giving to the source. Before you know it, they stopped listening to the source. Before you know it, Akadosh Baruch Hu also stopped giving the blessing and their income went down 90% in a very short period of time. As miraculous as it went up, it was even more miraculous how it went down. In another case, we literally saw couples get married, couples that never planned to get married, get together, get married, happy, love each other, everything great. But at some point, because the husband did not get the so-called attention that he was looking for, he decided to abandon ship and go in a different direction. A new rabbi, a new source, a new book, a new way. Only disaster followed. Problems in the house became standard. Divorce became an option. And literally health just simply became a distant memory because only bad health was it became the standard. We've seen people that have transformed their lives in positive ways, but then make a decision that they didn't even realize was bad until it was almost too late. A couple transformed their life. Everything was going good. They decide, you know what? Let's try something else, a different source. And before they knew it, they had a baby, but the baby wasn't a regular baby. To their surprise and dismay, the baby was born dying. And they had no idea what to do. And this new rabbi, this new source, this new community didn't have the interest, the inclination, or the knowledge of how to deal with this, nor did they want to. And this couple was left to deal with it themselves. Month after month, they're counting the days just hoping that the child survives. The good news is that at some point, they realized they made a mistake. And things changed. Blessings came. The child lived. But not all stories end that way. There was one time where a young man transformed his life in such a fashion, literally you could not recognize who he was just a few years before. But he decided that I'm going to go to the local kolel, the local bet midrash, which is a good idea. You should learn, you should dedicate. But before you know it, the rabbi of the local bet midrash convinced him that I'm the enemy, even though I saved him from going to a Christian school. I convinced his parents that were cursing me out to get him out of a Christian school. But somehow I became the enemy. In another case, it happened in a different place where the new rabbi convinced them that I'm leading him astray even though when I met him, he was an idol worshiper, although a Jew. Lastly, a very young guy that transformed his life in such a fashion, literally, you could just thank Hashem for being part of this person's life. But at some point, he didn't change direction. Always kept in touch from time to time, but just slowed down. Started getting spiritual nourishment from wherever it came. Instead of focusing on where it needs to, focusing where it's supposed to. Before you know it, the local rabbi gave him an idea to help a Jew. How can I help a fellow Jew? Yeah, you learned uh, from us in the lectures that uh, you should help Jews. Yeah, yeah, sure, help Jews. It's a good thing. So we have a Jew for you to help. Oh, me? Out of all the people in the community, I can help him? Yeah, yeah, only you can help him. Okay, how can I help him? 
you can help him by helping him in his immigration. Excuse me, I'm not a lawyer. I can't help him in immigration. And I don't have that much money that I can pay, but I can donate. He goes, no, 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 he doesn't need any money. He has plenty of money. Okay, so he doesn't need money. So, he's, so get a lawyer. No, 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 he doesn't need that. Okay, so what does he want? Why am I the one that can help him? The rabbi is telling him how he can help him. How? You can marry him. Excuse me? Yes, you, a guy, can marry another guy. But not really married. Just for the sake of the immigration. And they literally convinced this young guy to marry a guy. Why? For immigration. By the time I found out about it, it was almost too late. But Baruch Hashem, with a lot of prayer, a lot of prayer, and a complete transformation, he got out of that situation before it was too late, and him and his husband, based on the recommendation of the morons that call themselves rabbis in that community, before they both went to jail, when the government realized it's a whole complete sham. Rabotaya Kalim. When a Kadosh Baruch Hu gives you good, you say thank you. That's all. Nothing else. And when somebody told me that they really admire how I went to go visit my rabbi and I was able to learn with him over the summer, I told him, what do you think I did with my rabbi when I was there, aside from learning? Of course, I learned with Ephraim. I learned with him every day, Baruch Hashem. But what do you think I did when I went to Israel, aside from learning to with him? He said, I don't know. Uh, learn more? I don't know. Make angels come down from heaven? I said, okay, fine. Let's just say we brought a few angels down. Let's say we learned, okay, all the fantasies that you have, fine. What else do you think I enjoyed? What do you think my favorite part? Let's just do that. What's my favorite part of being next to my rabbi? What could I do? Oh, probably, I don't know, see him, uh, write a chidush? No. Oh, maybe uh, talk to him about mystical things? No. Oh, maybe, I don't know, uh, what rabbi? I said, you know what my favorite thing is to do? My favorite thing to do when I'm with my rabbi is to take out his garbage. That's my favorite thing to do. Why? Because I know that if I could take out his garbage, he's going to learn an extra few minutes of Torah. When that person looked at me, they didn't know what to make of it. You took out the rabbi's garbage? I said, no, no, no. I didn't take out the garbage. I love to take it out. And I ran for it every single time. And every time we'd argue about it because he didn't want me to do it. But I wanted to do it. Why? Because that way, he could learn an extra few minutes of Torah. And I know that if he learns an extra few minutes of Torah, I could benefit from it too. That's the difference between somebody that understands what the source is and people that simply don't understand until they lose the source. That's why Rabotai Karim, saying goodbye is sometimes the best thing you can do. When you say goodbye to your wife, when you say goodbye to your husband, for just the time that you're nida. For those couple of weeks or less, it's the best thing you could do because that means you're following the Torah. Other times, when you say goodbye, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. And that mistake is painted in gold. And it's a complete illusion. But you're only going to realize it either when it's too late or when there's already some damage that was done. The question is, whether you'll have humility guide you from that point on or arrogance, because that will determine what will happen next. With that being said, Bechavod, you guys could ask some questions. The, we the website for the uh, Kimcha de Pischa to donate to poor Jews in Eretz Israel is bhpesach.org. B as in Be'ezrat, H as in Hashem, P as in Pesach, E as in Eric, S as in Sam, A, A um, C, H, uh, dot org, Pesach. B, H, Pesach, or 
Vimesh and the rest of the team are going to put it online on our WhatsApp group, on our uh, website, on the uh, thread over here. So you could just click there and donate uh, and help. There's different packages that you can donate. You can do a lot of different things. What's the story with the temple? Oh, the, uh, the cow? <laughs> okay, so this is a question I've gotten at least, I don't know, a dozen times in the last couple of weeks uh, where apparently they're advertising that uh, the Temple Institute is going to be slaughtering a red heifer and making a sacrifice in order to purify people and supposedly they have a pure Kohen, a young kid that's pure, uh, and this is going to be one of the steps before Mashiach comes. Okay. Now, I don't know if the Temple Institute for sure is doing it. Meaning, I don't know if they're... so The guy that's running their social media and posting this nonsense uh, is the same people that are actually running the organization. But I can tell you based on Torah that this is all nonsense for a few reasons. Number one, there's no such thing as somebody pure. There's no such thing. Why? Because even if somebody was born, okay, and never touched a dead person, they're still impure. Why? Because they touched their mother, and their mother has touched a dead person, and therefore, they are impure. Needless to say, if they somehow miraculously came out of, her, came out of their mother's uh, belly and never touched her, miraculously, Certainly, they touched their father at some point, gave him a hug, gave him a kiss. Their father touched a dead person. And even if they never, they completely, miraculously left, you know, some type of immaculate conception and, 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 and birth, and never touched their mother and their father, they touched their brothers, they touched their uh, friends in school. And, meaning, the moment you touch a person, that person will make you tame. Why? Because even if that person themselves never touched the dead person, the way that the, uh, the tum'ah of the dead transfers from one person to another has no end. It doesn't go away. It's not a, it's not a cold. It's a spiritual status. And therefore, everybody is tamed. There's no such thing as somebody pure in the world today. It cannot exist. The only time there's any type of purity is when there is a red heifer where at the time of the Bet HaMikdash, they purify the person. This is not possible today because we don't have a Bet HaMikdash. So that's the reason number one why the uh, nonsense that they're advertising is literally nonsense for anybody who knows even a little bit of Torah. Number two, as far as the whole thing of slaughtering the red heifer and bringing a sacrifice, this cannot be done until Mashiach comes. So this is not something you could just like bully your way into and say, I'm going to do it. You can't do it. You're not allowed to do it because you're not allowed to make a sacrifice without the Bet HaMikdash. It's against the Torah. It's Isur Karet. So in the case the Temple Institute or whoever else is publicizing this really and it's not some rogue social media manager or some crazy person that's pretending to be them, then obviously they're wrong. If it is a rogue person, then obviously they're clueless and they're just trying to lead people astray. Generally speaking, they're only leading the, uh, the Christians astray because there's no real Jews that are Torah scholars that are even, you know, making a big deal out of this because everybody knows within literally five seconds, it's complete nonsense. So this is only to motivate, I don't know, money, uh, motivation, donations, I don't know, some type of uh, fake uh, spiritual elevation uh, motivation. So the whole thing about sacrificing a red heifer cannot be done. Until Mashiach comes, cannot be done until Mashiach comes. The end. There is no other way. Anyone tells you otherwise is a liar. You're a Pharisee. Yes, yes, absolutely. Pharisee, proud of it. And if your Yeshu was here, I'd hang him again. Poor man, okay. 
Religion is a nice idea until we start deferring in our beliefs. Uh, no, if your if your religion or if your belief agrees with everyone, that means you don't have a belief. That means that you are a chameleon. Uh, you just want to uh, get along with everybody and you stand for nothing and therefore you are nothing. Uh, anyone that's of any substance, of any value, uh, of any level of success, of any uh, worth, had to stand for something, had to believe something, had to be motivated by something. And the truth is, you are too. Uh, you may not uh, be motivated by uh, your connection to God or religious beliefs, but certainly you're motivated by something, whether it's your uh, belief in uh, the, uh, let's say, the priority of uh, money, savings, uh, I don't know, cars, all types of material possessions, and things of that nature. Some, everybody has some type of motivation. The problem is that when you're motivated by money, by cars, by uh, people liking you, uh, having so-called many friends, the older you get, the more you realize this is just simply an illusion. Uh, the more you're motivated by that stuff, the more you realize that you really stand for nothing because all of those things that you believe in are temporary. They're all temporary. The car collection is temporary. The money is temporary. All of these things are temporary. But when your motivation is following God and, is, and, and being uh, a servant of God, which by default would make you a better person, a better husband, a better father, a better mother, a better son, a better daughter, a better business person, a more, more ethical person, more ethical in every aspect, when you follow the laws of the Torah, you realize not only is this better, but it is intentionally different than everything else because the standard in society is the opposite of good. The standard of society is the opposite of good. Standard of society is immorality. Standard in society is uh, ego. Standard in society is selfishness. Everybody does things for their own benefit. They're not doing things just for the sake of the greater good. The standard in society is arrogance, getting attention, uh, you know, getting uh, you know, everybody to focus on you, even if that means that they're focusing on you stepping on somebody else's face. So the standard in society is the opposite of good, whereas the standard of the Torah is the ultimate good. And the more you observe the Torah, the better you become. So if a person follows the Torah, certainly they're going to be a much better person than everybody else out there because they're following the Torah. If somebody is not following the Torah, needless to say, if they're uh, you know, uh, desecrating the Torah, mocking the Torah, scorning the Torah, then certainly they are going to be the worst person in society. The more you scorn the Torah, the worst person you are uh, in society. And, and you can see that an example of the worst people that, uh, that, is, uh, that have existed in recent history have been people that have gone against the Torah. Have gone against the Torah. The, the whole uh, uh, so-called sexual revolution that you've had in Western society and not even in Eastern society uh, was uh, all, all spearheaded by the wicked thoughts of a guy named Kinsey. Uh, and this Kinsey, Machshimo Vizicho, he was... Uh, a, uh, he came from a Catholic house, but he was an avid homosexual atheist that hated God and hated everything to do with religion to the point that he wouldn't even hire anybody that uh, was not an atheist. He hated Jews. He hated the Christians. He hated everybody that was connected to God in any way, shape, or form. And uh, this is the guy that, in so many words, spearheaded pornography, spearheaded all of the pedophilia, all of the horrible things that you have in society today that everybody's crying foul about. You know, the people that, uh, you know, you see doing all of these gruesome, horrible things, these pedophiles, these rapists, these uh, serial murderers and so on, all of them, all of them, one after another, are desecrating the Torah, are violating the Torah, are enemies of the Torah. The vast majority of them are atheists uh, and, and the rest of them are idol worshippers. You're not going to see a righteous religious Jew do any of those things. If you see someone that's doing those things, even if they pretend to be uh, a religious Jew, obviously they're not because the Torah forbids all of those things. So the more a person is in line with the Torah, the more they're in line with the ultimate good. The more a person is against the Torah... The, the more a person is against good. Now, as far as why are Christians considered idol worshippers, 
Very simple. God said, I am one. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hero Israel, <coughs> Hashem our, our God, Hashem is one. Meaning, God is only one. Also, if you look at Parashat Bechukotai, um, uh, um, Parashat Kitavo, uh, also actually easiest place, Parashat Balak. Parashat Balak, uh, it literally says, God is not a man that he would change his ideas, change his mind. So God is not a man. So the Christian church, uh, the New Testament, if you will, whatever you want, you know, whoever believes in the New Testament, whether it's the Christian church, the, the missionaries from Messianic Judaism, which is really, you know, uh, uh, evangelical Christians in disguise, or uh, the Catholics, they all believe in the New Testament. The New Testament says that God became a person. And the moment that they say God became a person, that's considered idol worship. Because God is not a person. God is, it's not that he can't become a person. He won't. He's not. A person is limited. Limited in their abilities. Limited in every single aspect. A person can't even eat food without, you know, somehow finding a source for it. This is also one of the uh, uh, things about the New Testament that's hard for me to understand how people believe this nonsense, where the, uh, the guy, Yoshke, Jesus, goes and uh, he sees that the tree is not bearing fruits and he curses the tree. Now, if he was really God, why didn't he just make the tree bear fruit? Or needless to say, if he was really God, why does he need to eat? So here itself... It's a, it's, it shows that the New Testament is completely full of nonsensical uh, uh, beliefs. More, there are lectures that I've made over the years where it shows that there are literally mistakes in the New Testament that are easy to spot for anyone that's actually looking the right way. Uh, you know, it has uh, wrong addresses according to uh, archaeology, according to literally evidence you could see today. It has uh, a lot of mathematical errors and so on. Point being is, if you want to know more about why Christianity is considered, uh, or any belief in the New Testament is considered idolatry, you can watch my lectures about it. You can just simply type New Testament on the channel, or you can type in Jesus or Ye uh, Yeshua, uh, on the channel, you'll see a bunch of lectures uh, discussing that particular topic. I'm not saying it to uh, simply insult and anger people. Uh, I'm saying it in order to save you, in order to get you away from idolatry, because if you are now on a path of idolatry, and you realize it's idolatry, and you abandon ship, like many other people have already, Baruch Hashem, then you can go on the righteous path. And you could end up in heaven as a result of it. So even though it's not an easy path, it's not a, uh, uh, a painless path, but it's the right path, and it'll help you in the end. Simple. No one discussed my question, but it needs answered. I don't know where the question is. Anyone that has a question, don't write, I have a question. Just write the question. Especially that by the time you write the question, there's like 50 comments after that, so we don't even get to your question. Okay, let's just go again. Let's see. Uh, why was the Noah's Ark found in Turkey? Uh, okay, so uh, if you look at the Torah, in Parashat Noah, at the end of the parasha, it talks about how the, uh, the Ark eventually... Uh, parked uh, or stopped and it was in essence on top of a mountain because obviously the water was above the mountains and the ark was obviously floating above them but then as the water receded the ark eventually stopped because it was on top of a mountain and it, the Torah says that it was in Mount Ararat Mount Ararat is in Turkey so it's where the Torah says that it was 4,000 years ago is exactly where 
the uh, archaeologists believe that they have uh, found it, and they have evidence and videos and so on for 30 plus years already uh, of, of this. Uh, so it's exactly where the Torah says it was, is exactly where they, uh, they have found it. Can I be your YouTube moderator? Um, I don't know who you are, but uh, to be honest with you, I don't know, really know how to do that. But I'm sh I have a team of people that work for me. They're supposed to be doing the moderating, but I guess there's too much to ask. Uh, let's see. How sad? Well, I don't know what that means. I love you, Rabbi. Love you, too. Ooh. Where's the question, though? Uh, Appreciate the compliments, but we need questions. Uh, Rabbi, have you read the Quran? Uh, I read enough of it to know that it's full of nonsense. And I've quoted it a few times in uh, lectures over the last six months. How do I pray? Uh, okay, so <clears throat> if you're Jewish, the way to pray is by getting yourself a siddur. Usually it looks like it's a little book like this. They have plenty of them in the synagogues. And uh, you pray three times a day. There's three prayers a day. Uh, there's shachrit, which is the morning prayer, mincha, and which is afternoon, and uh, arvit, which is the evening prayer. Now, uh, if you have a Orthodox synagogue local to you, once you go to a local synagogue, speak to the rabbi over there, they'll tell you exactly when to come, and I'm sure they'll even have somebody that can teach you how to pray, what to read, when to read it, and so on, alongside with other people at the same time. Now, if you're not Jewish, uh, then prayer should be done from your own heart, meaning your own words. You don't need to read from a Jewish sidu. Uh, but rather, you should actually just say exactly what you feel uh, to Hashem, ask Him, thank Him, uh, and in so many words, uh, you know, connect to Hashem with your own words. You don't need to have a structured prayer or even have a limitation of when to pray. You can pray all the time. You can pray sometimes. Uh, you should pray often, but uh, there's no uh, um, specific uh, rules for you as a non-Jew. But certainly you should. <sighs> okay.
look at some questions from Facebook. So, why do Jews pray three times a day? Uh, well, Avram Avinu made a takana of prayer in the morning. That's Shachrit. Yitzchak Avinu made the uh, prayer in the afternoon, and Yaakov made the prayer at night. Now, the Torah commands us to pray. It doesn't necessarily say you have to pray three times. Uh, but since our forefathers and our sages prayed multiple times a day, that's what we do. The obligation is to pray at least once. This is the reason why Jewish women are obligated only to pray once per day and not uh, three times a day. Uh, they certainly can pray three times a day, but they're obligated to pray at least once. Uh, as far as the uh, man, a man has to pray three times a day. <coughs> but as far as the uh, prayer... It's, the, it's not the only thing that we do. There's also doing blessings before you eat, after you eat, uh, after you go to the bathroom, uh, you know, um, in all types of times. There's many different uh, blessings that are short prayers uh, that you do, even before you take medicine or before, uh, uh, you know, or while you're actually leaving the city, you have to make a certain prayer. There's uh, a whole list of different blessings or short prayers that you have to make throughout your entire day. This is a constant uh, reminder for a person to bless God, to recognize God, to thank God, to acknowledge God, uh, and to know that they're under His. Uh, they're in His world. It's not your world; it's His. Can you kosher a stove top burner with sensing technology? Um, no, the, the way that you kosher a, uh, the way you kosher things is with fire, not, uh, it's either fire or water, it depends on how it became unkosher. But the stove, it's a, uh, uh, it's not something that, um, you could do it with sensors. It's, uh, what do I have against Chabad and Why? If you're talking about Chabad of yesteryear, the original Chabad, the original Chabad based on Atanya is fantastic. We speak very highly of it. We've even used them in sources, sources uh, in, in different lectures. If you're talking about uh, the uh, heretics among Chabad today, uh, then I have everything against them. They are doing things that are against the Torah and they're misleading people. So, uh, you know, you have to decide which Chabad you're defending here. If you're defending the, uh, the, you know, the original Chabad, there's nothing for you to defend. We're on the same team. Uh, but if you're defending today's Chabad, then uh, you are also an enemy because you know, somebody that's uh, in line with an ideology that tells people that they don't have to do tshuva and that uh, God needs you and that he's going to apologize to you instead of you doing tshuva, then obviously you have a very serious problem. What is Chabad doing against the Torah? I just gave you a bunch of examples. You want another example? They just came out with a video uh, of a story that uh, one of the famous Chabad rabbis uh, publicized and is proud of. It's uh, Simon Jacobson. And he said that he was in some type of weekend retreat, seminar, whatever it was, with about 500 plus um, um, young people, young Jews, that were secular. And uh, they were doing all types of things during the weekend. I ask, ask, you know, one of the activities was to ask questions. So there was apparently uh, three different types of rabbis there, according to Simon Jacobson's story. He's describing it as three different types of rabbis. There was a uh, him as the Chabadnik, there was an orthodox rabbi, and there was a conservative rabbi. So already over there, you can see from the way he tells the story, and this was published in 
uh, uh, Yoel Gold's uh, uh, YouTube channel. So you could see this six minute, seven minute video yourself. Anyway, he already from the story, you can see that Chabad does not identify themselves with Orthodox Judaism. They identify themselves as something else. Something else. Which again, if you ask the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the, the Reb Rashash, the, 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 uh, the, the Tanya, they would not identify with today's uh, Chabad. They would identify with Orthodox Judaism. But nonetheless, today's leaderless Chabad is very different. They don't identify themselves as Orthodox Jews. They say that they're different. And Simon Jacobson is not the first one to say this. Manus Friedman says it all the time. He says, don't be religious. We're not religious people. So, point is, is that already from the story you see that he says Chabad and Orthodox Judaism are different. Then, on top of that, he is uh, representing Judaism alongside a conservative rabbi, which according to the Torah, uh, is considered a heretic. So, to be on the same stage already is, again, another layer of problem. Now, if this was the only problems, this I wouldn't even tell you the story because it it's not worth your time. But the crux of the story is that at some point, 500 young people are asking questions and they ask the ultimate question. What's the ultimate question? What happens to all of us secular people? They're talking about themselves. What's going to happen to all of us secular people if the Mashiach arrives now? The Orthodox rabbi says, may Hashem have mercy. May Hashem have mercy. In so many words, it's not good. Simon Jacobson was very dismayed because they booed him. Boo, boo, boo. Why? They don't like to hear that. They want to hear that when Mashiach comes, everyone gets presents. So when the conservative rabbi refused to answer or didn't have an answer, the stage was left for Simon Jacobson. And why did he say to them, these spiritually poor young people ask the ultimate question, what's going to happen if Mashiach comes? In so many words, are we okay in the current path that we're on of not observing Shabbat, not observing Kashrut, not observing Torah and Mitzvot and so on? Or are we going to be in trouble because we didn't do it? So instead of telling them, you would be in trouble. So it's, since he didn't come yet, let's take advantage of it and do tshuva and start keeping Shabbat and start keeping, you know, family purity for, you know, and start keeping modesty and start following the Torah, the same Torah that made the Jewish people Jewish. What does he say to them? Oh, you know, who knows who is considered righteous according to God and who is not considered righteous because uh, the uh, one of the Labavitch Rebbe's, the, the Rebbe Rashash, he manipulated a complete story, which is a, literally, this is a, a, a complete fabrication of a story. The story itself is real, but he manipulated the story, which is, the Rebbe Rashash said that to his Hasidim, that there was a simple Jew that had a very, very elevated neshama, even though he was a simple Jew. So the real meaning is that this simple Jew was Torah observant, kept Shabbat, but just was not a Torah scholar. What Simon Jacobson manipulated it into being is that simple Jew meant he's a Shabbat desecrator and he uh, eats non-kosher and he doesn't keep anything just like the people, the 500 people in the crowd. So since the Rebbe Shah says that he's okay and in fact even, he's even better than everybody else, then, oh, you guys are the best. You guys are the, you that are violating Shabbat, some of which are idol worshippers, some of which are you know, uh, doing all types of things that are against God. You guys are the most uh, religious. You guys are the most uh, righteous. At that moment, he spiritually massacred 500 or more Jews. Like there was a spiritual pogrom that day. I would not be surprised if that day was right before October 7th before the, ma the, the, the physical massacre of Jewish people happened. I would not be surprised. He literally had the perfect opportunity to help these young people do tshuva by simply answering their question. They asked for it. So he can't even say, listen, I don't want to scare them. They asked for it themselves. They knew that there's a possibility that their answer is not going to be what they like. But instead of telling them what the Torah says, 
which is that you have to do tshuva, that you have to keep mitzvot, that you have to do what Hashem says. What does He say? You are all perfect. You're all perfect. Now, the Kli Akal in Parashat Bereshit, on the 49th chapter, it says in the name of the prophet Yeshaya, chapter 11, verse 4, that the uh, people that literally are going against rebuking, and even more so, that uh, the um, people that are not doing tshuva are considered wicked, and that a Baruch Hu is going to punish them severely, and there's not going to be any type of uh, mercy on this. Uh, when the Mashiach comes, Beruach piv yamit rasha, that in the uh, the um, the uh, words that will come out of his mouth will destroy the wicked. And who are these wicked? These wicked are the people that are not keeping Torah and Mitzvot. These people are Rish'ei Yisrael. The wicked people among Am Yisrael are going to be killed by the Mashiach. The Mashiach will kill them. And the prophet Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter uh, 11, verse number 4, uh, it uh, talks about how uh, you are obligated to rebuke and you're obligated to rebuke the wicked Jew that is not observing Torah and Mitzvot. So when the Simon Jacobson goes and tells a bunch of young Jews that they're already righteous and they don't need to change, that is considered apikosut, heresy. That is considered distortion of the Torah. That is considered spiritually murdering every single one of them. And this, Simon Jacobson, is one of the most famous Chabad rabbis today in the English-speaking world. So, and this is already after we've made, I don't know how many dozens of lectures against the most famous one, Manus Friedman, Shem Rashaim Yerkav. So, point being is, many of the Chabadniks support Simon Jacobson, and the people that think like him. Uh, and this is distortion of a Torah. I'm very, very disappointed that Yoel Gold uh, uh, published this. I even sent him an email and waiting for a response uh, to see uh, what he says and if he's going to uh, remove this. Uh, quite frankly, uh, I don't think he's going to respond to me. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's sad. It's sad that, uh, people just, uh, uh, take the Torah and throw it in the garbage. Now, if you don't want to answer it, don't answer the question. Like the conservative heretic didn't answer. But if you're already going to answer it, don't change the Torah. But that's what many times they do. And this is unfortunately standard. Now, if you're talking about, uh, the Chabad of... 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, that's a completely different Chabad that has nothing to do with today's Chabad. That has nothing to do with today's Chabad. Well, I posted a video of a rabbi talking about the book of Manus Friedman. Who is he and how do I know that? How do you know the rabbi? That's my rabbi, Rabbi Ephraim Kachlon. Rabbi Ephraim Kachlon is the rabbi I talked about in today's lecture. He's an extraordinary Torah scholar. He's also a Dayan. Uh, he has many smichot, he has written over 50 books, uh, not just uh, books with stories, Psak uh, he has a whole uh, shoot, uh, responsa, uh, that is, uh, so one of them is uh, f- uh, five volumes with the sixth one coming out soon, there's a couple of other responses aside from that, Baruch Hashem, he's a uh, well-respected uh, uh, Torah scholar. He's got an askamot by Gdolei Israel, whether it's a uh, Rav Ovadi Yosef, Allah Vashalom, Rav Mazuz, Rav Yitzchak Yosef. Uh, many, many of Gdolei Israel uh, have uh, and continue to support him uh, and impressed by his uh, genius. Uh, so he's uh, very young in comparison to the people that would have stopped, you know, achieve such feats, but Baruch Hashem, we were blessed. We were blessed to have him in our generation, and even more so, uh, we were blessed to learn directly with him, uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, every day, for more than uh, a decade already, Baruch Hashem.
is the fruit of knowledge of good and evil still something that exists today? Uh, yes, there's no reason for it not to exist today. It's in Gan Eden. There's a physical Gan Eden, there's a spiritual Gan Eden. The Gan Eden in this world, it still exists. I'm afraid of converting and desecrate Hashem. I feel like there is too much work to do for my character traits. What do you recommend? I don't know you well enough to recommend anything, uh, but uh, I could tell you that, um, you know, as far as to uh, desecrate God's name, if you're trying to follow the Torah, there's no reason for you to be concerned of such a thing. But if you're going to follow your uh, desires, then certainly it's better off for you not to uh, convert. But it doesn't mean that you're going to be okay either way. Because if you follow your heart uh, and your desires, you're going to be a wicked non-Jew also. So it's uh, either way you lose. Uh, can I take a pill on Pesach if the ca casing contains rice? I'm not benefiting from kitniot. Uh, it depends. It depends if uh, you know if how how much your rabbi is uh, stringent. But generally speaking, anything that is a casing for uh, pills, whether it's gluten or other types of uh, vegetables and so on, uh, usually it's uh, processed to such an extent that it's not considered food anymore. Uh, and therefore, the, it generally would not be a problem if you were a Sephardic Jew. Uh, as far as Ashkenazi, it depends on how stringent your Rav is. If he's really, really stringent, uh, then it would depend on the medicine. Meaning, if the medicine is, you know, to save your life, then everything's allowed. You're allowed to eat pig if it's going to save your life. Uh, but if, a, uh, if it's just like a vitamin uh, that you don't necessarily need to have, uh, and you only take it randomly, then, you know, he may be stringent with you and tell you that uh, it's better off you wait until after Pesach. So it depends. It depends on the circumstance. Why did you grow your payers? You've asked the question no less than 50 times. Uh, I grew my peyot because I needed somebody to ask me one day, why did I grow my peyot? So then I could have something to say during my lecture because I ran out of words. Uh, I grew the peyot for the same exact reason that anybody else grows their peyot, which is to show Hashem that we love his mitzvot. Uh, and, you know, we're not allowed as Jews to shave over here. Uh, there's five points that uh, you're not allowed to uh, shave. Uh, but even more so, when you love Hashem's mitzvot, you want to do extra. Uh, so there's, it's a customary among Jews already for thousands of years to uh, grow peyot, to grow peyot. Now, as far as the... Uh, Obligation. You don't have an obligation to grow peyot. That's why I don't tell people, grow peyot. But uh, I did it because I wanted to do it. And my, uh, when I asked my rabbi about it, uh, he himself also has peyot. And um, he said, sure, why not? And therefore I moved forward and I grew. Now, uh, the, uh, one of the big motivations aside from that was also that I saw that my kids' uh, peyot were growing. Uh, and uh, I knew that, you know, my kids would grow up, and if I don't grow my peyot also, and they have peyot, they would have a conflict. You know, why do they have peyot, and their father doesn't have peyot? So that was also an additional motivation. Uh, but needless to say, again, it's not an obligation. If somebody wants to do it, they can do it. If they don't want to do it, they don't have to do it. Uh, but it's surprising to me that people care so much about my appearance. I mean, there's so many other things in the Torah. Uh, it just... It's just strange to me that people care about, you know, how I look and, you know, whether I have peyote or I have a beard. I mean, 
It's, it's, it's hair. It grows for free. Is there a punishment for people who are trying to do tshuva but fail during the process? Uh, sure, there is a punishment if you don't do tshuva for the things you failed at. But it's expected for you to fail. No one goes straight to the top uh, without failure. And there's a verse in the Torah about it. En tzadik shelo yichta. Or sheva pamim tzadik yifol bekam. Uh, there's a multiple verses that talk about it. even the righteous fall seven times. There's no such thing as a righteous person who does not make, uh, you know, make a sin. So it's expected that you're going to do it. But just because it's expected that you'll make mistakes, it doesn't mean that Hashem is just simply going to, you know, doesn't care uh, or that it's allowed to make mistakes or it's allowed to make sins. It just means that Hashem also has a way for you to fix those mistakes by doing tshuva uh, and, uh, and, and obviously fixing it the next time. You know, it's not... Uh, uh, Hashem did not create us as angels, so He knows we're going to make mistakes. But at the same token, this is not to say uh, in a distorted mentality to think that, oh, since He knew we're going to sin, therefore He doesn't care we're going to sin. The Gemara says, anyone that says that Hashem doesn't care, that He's going to get an extra punishment in uh, Shemaim where they're going to cut Him up, <coughs> cut him up his, his intestines. Uh, uh, so, point is, is that a person uh, has to understand that God knows everything he knows our flaws he knows our uh, abilities uh, and he also gave us the ability to fix uh, just like if you broke something you'll you know if it's valuable to you you'll try to fix it same concept with your soul if you broke something you have to try your best to fix it What does Hashem mean? Hashem, the word Hashem means the name. <laughs> because the name of God is so holy that we can't just say it. And therefore we say the name, Hashem. We can only say the name of God either if reading a verse from the Torah or prayer. What should a parent do with a son that doesn't want the Torah path? It depends how old the son is. If the son is a uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine years old, uh, then uh, it's your job to convince them. Otherwise, uh, through rewards, through all types of incentives, uh, learning with them, and so on. But if the son is already, uh, you know, teenager, 17, 18, 20 years old, then unfortunately it's too late. Uh, you can't force him to do anything. Uh, in fact, even your uh, inspiration of such a uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, such an age is very very limited at that time so you just gotta hope for the best you know at the very least uh, uh, try to uh, send him to lectures give him lectures to watch uh, but uh, it's very very difficult uh, for you to just start inspiring your son at 17 18 years old if you haven't done anything for the first 17 years uh, but if you if he did grow religious and he just abandoned the way then uh, you know you have to have somebody uh, talk to him and see what's the reason. Why did he leave everything? Is it just purely desires? Is it lack of belief, lack of knowledge? Usually it's desire, but nonetheless, it depends. It depends, you know, which you know where the son is, how old he is, why he doesn't want to be religious, why he does. You know, <clears throat> it all depends. Um, 
free Palestine. You're right, yes, yes, free Palestine. We just freed them from a few more terrorists today. Be'ezot Hashem will free them of a few more terrorists tomorrow. And every day thereafter, we'll free them of 3, 5, 10, 50, 100, 200 more terrorists. Eventually, it'll uh, reach uh, the ultimate goal, which is completely free of all terrorists and a place that you could uh, live and, uh, and prosper in. Um, you know, so yeah, we're freeing, we're freeing Palestine every single day, every single day. We're very dedicated to it. We appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Appreciate your support of freeing Palestine of terrorists and anarchy and all types of things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Free Palestine. Go free Palestine. Yes. Free, free. Yes. Free, free of terrorism, free of stupidity free of people like you free everything free How did the rabbis in the Talmud know about Gehenna if it's not mentioned in the five books of Moses? So there's two problems with your question. Number one, you have lack of knowledge of the written Torah, meaning the five books of Moses. And number two, you have lack of knowledge of the oral Torah. So lack of knowledge of the written Torah is easier to prove uh, because that doesn't require a belief. That just simply requires you looking up the verse. Go to Parashat Korach. Parashat Korach says that Korach, that went against Moshe Rabbeinu, the uh, ground opened up and swallowed him and his followers alive. And they're screaming there until today. So that's, that place is one of the places of Gehenom that's called Sheol. You know, Gehenom has seven chambers. Each one has different names. One of them is called Sheol. Sheol, Sheola. Uh, so point is, is that uh, in the Torah, it already talks about Gehenom. This is one of the many places. Number two, uh, in, as far as the oral Torah, the oral Torah is also what we got at Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu not only received the five books, you know, the, 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 written, the written Torah up to Parashat Yitro, and then he, um, Hashem told him what to write over the next 40 years to complete it from Parashat Yitro, um, but uh, on top of that, he got the oral Torah, which explains the laws that are written in the written Torah. Without one, the other one wouldn't exist. Meaning, when God told us, keep Shabbat, he didn't tell us how to keep Shabbat. That's what we have the oral Torah. When God told us to put on tefillin, he didn't tell us how the tefillin are made, what shape they are, what color they are, what's in them. That's the oral Torah. So, when, he, when God told us about kashrut, about kosher food, He didn't give us all the details. That's in the oral Torah. Everything that we have, uh, all the laws that we have, are explained in the oral Torah. In addition to that, there's also teachings about the upper worlds, one of them being Genom. And uh, there is many, many different sources, thousands, thousands upon thousands of sources from the different sages uh, that discussed it, uh, uh, teachings about Genom. And in fact, one of the sources uh, of teachings about Genom is Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, his personal experience where God actually showed him Genom. So God showed him Genom and Moshe Rabbeinu wrote it. He wrote, and in essence, he transmitted it to the rest of the people that we know until today. What he saw, all, what questions he asked. So it, you have to understand that there's a written Torah and there's an oral Torah. If a person doesn't believe in the oral Torah, that means that they will never understand the written Torah either. They will never understand the written Torah either. And unfortunately, many people don't realize that the two have to go together. Have to go together. And as far as uh, all of the information that we have, uh, you know, while all of it gets sourced from 
the written Torah in some form or another, there's a lot more writings in the oral Torah than the written Torah uh, because it's a uh, expansion of every single idea, every single word, every you know. So, if let's say there is Bereshit uh, Bara Elokim et Hashemayim v'Taretz, the first verse of the Torah, which is in the beginning, Hashem created, right? So the word Bereshit, the word Bereshit from that word Bereshit, the Gaon Mivilna uh, extrapolated over a thousand laws over a thousand laws from the first word of the Torah. Furthermore, the word Bereshit doesn't just mean in the beginning, but also means with wisdom, that God created the world with wisdom. And the Ramban extrapolates that to teach what does he mean by in wisdom, and wisdom of the creation, and he teaches different uh, things about that, and different sages taught many different lessons just simply from extrapolating uh, the secrets from the first word of the Torah. And the same thing can be done with every word of the Torah. Every word in the Torah is just as important as another. There's no such thing as one word or one verse being more important than the other. All verses and all words in the Torah are equally important. So when a person understands that the entire oral Torah is extrapolated you know, from the, uh, oral to- from the written Torah, everything has to have a source somewhere, then they know that one cannot go with the other. The other. But again, it's a uh, the, the the full scope of this knowledge is will take you know uh, further than a lifetime, further than ten lifetimes uh, to get. But that's what we we delve into a little bit more each time, uh, and uh, extrapolate more, and, and and learn more, and do more, and uh, apply more. Uh, when a woman is finished with her cycle, how many days extra does she need to wait? To be with, oh, there's a, okay, so a, a Jewish woman uh, has to, it depends if she's Sephardi or she's Ashkenazi. Because uh, uh, one has to wait a minimum of four days, uh, or and the other one is five days, depending on a Sephardi or Ashkenazi, which is during the time of bleeding. Meaning, even if she bleeds for only two days, she still has to wait at least four days before she counts to seven, or at least five days before she counts to seven. Uh, seven clean days. Uh, so it would either be four plus seven or five plus seven or until she bleeds, until she stops bleeding, plus seven. Meaning if she bleeds for a month and then stops, then you count seven from then. And then she's clean. Then she goes to the mikveh. So this is usually applicable after birth. When a woman gives birth, usually she bleeds for another two months in most cases uh, before she could start counting the seven days. Some women more, some women a little less, but more or less it's usually around two months. <coughs> uh, how do I do tshuva for what you talked about? My rabbi took me in and helped me immensely do tshuva, but I left. How do I fix this? The rabbi unfortunately passed away since then. Uh, well, obviously you can't fix the... Uh, the past completely because you can't learn from that rabbi anymore but you have to obviously find a uh, someone to replace him and don't make the same mistake thank you rabbi it feels like this lecture was just for me you were the source of everything I've learned in the last two years and counting Baruch Hashem. Um, I have a family member that is scheduled for a heart procedure on the first day of Passover he tried to change this date, but was unable to. He has a problem with his heart valve and does not close properly. Can he have such a procedure on Yom Tov? If it's a life risk, then yeah, of course. If it's not a life risk, then no, but from what you're saying, it seems like it's a life risk. If Hashem's mitzvot are supposed to be easy, and it's supposed to be easier during conversion, what am I doing wrong? It depends if you're doing it by yourself. If you're doing this, you know, if you're doing it with somebody else, it depends if you're part of a Jewish community or you're by yourself. It's easy if you're doing it with other people and you're part of a Jewish community. But if you're doing it by yourself, 
Uh, and certainly it's difficult. If you're doing it with somebody that's not doing it, it makes it even more difficult. So it's easy when you're doing it with the Jewish community uh, because it's a, everybody motivates each other, you get people to learn from, but if you're doing it by yourself in the middle of nowhere, then certainly it's difficult because you don't even know what to do. And if you're doing it while living with somebody that's not doing it or doing the opposite, then it's the ultimate difficulty. Uh, so depends what circumstance you're in. Mattis Friedman calls himself the most popular YouTube rabbi, but he is not. There are other rabbis with more subscribers in other languages as well. He's a proud man. Okay, thanks for the uh, info. Before I was religious in the 90s, I went to 8 to 10 shuls on Wednesday night in New York City with Simon Jacobson. Although a nice man, he never told one secular person to keep Shabbat or Kashrut. Okay, so it proves my point that even after 30 years, 25 years, he has not changed and has practically deteriorated. I'm seeing a guy, he's not religious at all, but we have a very good connection and he treats me very well. I want him to become more religious, but he doesn't really want, since he says he thinks the whole religion is a lie. How can I convince him? Uh, well, if you're Jewish and he is Jewish, uh, then you should stop the relationship and uh, as far as the physical aspects of it and uh, start talking to see if there's really a relationship or it's just simply lust. Uh, if you're not Jewish, then uh, you have obviously more room for error here, meaning that uh, you know non-Jews, you're allowed to be together Um without marriage, because there's no concept of marriage for non-Jews like Jewish people have. Uh, but you should also know that, you know, to change people uh, is not a simple thing. You know, you have to uh, lead by example, meaning that if you're asking one person to be moral, while you're not being moral, it's hypocritical. If you're asking people to not steal while you're a thief, it's hypocritical. No one's going to want to listen to you. So it's very hard to change somebody um, you know, and, and when you're doing in the same thing they are to a certain extent. Uh, the last thing is if, um, you know, you want to help him, you should get him to watch lectures that are going to prove that he's, his current belief system is wrong. There's many lectures that uh, I've made and uh, Rav Mizrahi has made and other rabbis have made that show the proof uh, of divinity of the Torah. And you could show him those things, and uh, hopefully he wakes him up. Why does Hashem let do animal sacrifices, and the other, on the other hand, Hashem orders not to cut or do anything to the trees? Uh, it's not necessarily true. Uh, as far as the animals, not on all animals can become a sacrifice. And not all trees you have to keep. Uh, obviously, these animals that are being sacrificed, there's fire. The fire is, you know, there's wood. There's wood there that uh, they collected every day. There was a whole room in the Bet HaMikdash where they would uh, store the wood. Uh, so uh, the, the wood comes from trees. The trees are obviously being cut uh, in order to make the wood, and that's being burned. So it's, you know, as far as the uh, trees, not all trees uh, have to be maintained, and not all uh, trees are cut. Same thing with animals. Not all animals are sacrificed. Not all animals are not sacrificed. All of creation was for the sake of Jewish people serving God. That's the purpose of all of creation. That's the purpose of animals. That's the purpose of the flowers. That's the purpose of the businesses. That's the purpose of everything that you have in the world is for the sake of Am Yisrael serving God and following the Torah. Uh, 
on most of the religious weddings, I heard that newlyweds dance together at the end of the wedding reception and sometimes with their immediate families too. Is this allowed? No, it's not allowed and you're not even allowed to believe it because it will be Lashon Ha. No, a man is not allowed to show affection to a woman in public. Dancing is a form of affection and it's forbidden. Needless to say, if it's from religious people. Okay, we're almost done. One or two questions and we're done. What is a rabbi? A rabbi is a teacher that specifically focuses on teaching you Torah. Isn't only Hasidim grow peyot? No. Uh, Mordechai Yehudi in the book of Esther uh, is identified as a Yehudi, as a Jew. And the Ben Ishchai says the reason why he was the first time in the Torah that the word Yehudi, the, the word Jew appears, is in the book of Esther about Mordechai, was because Mordechai was identifiable as a Jew from far away because he had peot. He had peot, much, much bigger peot than I do. Uh, so, uh, and obviously this is 3,000 years ago almost, uh, over 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago. And uh, this is well before the uh, Baal Shem Tov's Hasidut uh, that started only a few hundred years ago. Uh, peot are before the Baal Shem Tov, Peot are before Hasidut of today. One more question and we're done. Sages teach that Moshe was the only one to perceive prophecy without being asleep. On the other hand, the other prophets were not able to attain such levels because it was too much sanctity. Okay, so what is the question? It wasn't necessarily too much sanctity, it's uh, also Avodat Midot. You look at the uh, Rambam, Shmona Prakim, it talks about how he perfected himself. That's the reason why um, he perfected his character traits and became the humblest man of all time, and that's what made him the ultimate vessel of prophecy. Okay, I think... Uh, oh, here we go, last question. Oh, yeah, yeah, another one of these. What do I think about uh, Shmuli Boteach and versus the Christian Jew hater scandal of a few weeks ago? I already spoke about this more on... Um, I think a week, two weeks ago, I spoke about it already. Uh, I've warned people about Shmuli Botech already for at least five, six years. Uh, and uh, as far as the other one, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, you know, I care less about uh, what uh, the, uh, the other person said. Uh, Anti-Semitic, uh, quite frankly, uh, you know, the whole, the whole thing about anti-Semitism where people keep pressing the anti-Semitic button, um, they're forgetting that God controls anti-Semitism. He uses it in order to get us to do tshuva. Uh, when we do tshuva, there's no anti-Semitism. Don't do tshuva, there's anti-Semitism. Okay, Rabotai Karim, thank you very much for learning with me. Again, anybody that wants to order books from the website to distribute in the Jewish community for free, go to uh, bhkiruv.org or kiruvstore.org, K-I-R-U-V. S T O R E dot org, and you can order some USBs and uh, uh, books uh, to distribute for free in your Jewish community. Please don't sell them; just distribute them for free. That's the whole point of why we're sending it to you for free. Uh, anyone that wants to fulfill the mitzvah of Kimcha de Pischa by helping us feed poor Jews that are in Eretz Israel, which include Torah scholars, 
uh, widows, orphans, people with a whole lot of problems beyond what you you know what what people are able to even handle hearing about. Needless to say, living. Um, you could donate on bhpesach.org. And if, uh, last but not least, if you think this shiur applied to you, don't be mistaken. You're right. It does apply to you. Because that's the point. Kol tuv, b'chav ha'atzlacha, t'skul mitzvot, Shabbat Shalom. We will learn again, Bezot Hashem, next week. There's a lot of really cool stuff on our websites. Uh, new features. Uh, and uh, a lot more uh, projects that are on the way that Bezat Hashem will help Am Yisrael get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to publicize HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name and uh, know that He is the one and only God.